Hey guys, welcome to the Savvy Musician Show. I'm your host, Leah McHenry, and I have a very, very special guest today. His name is Brett Manning. He's a personal friend of mine and somebody I look, I look up to very, very much. He is one of the world's most sought after vocal coaches. He's personally transformed my voice over the last couple of years. I'm doing things that I could never do before. And uh, the reason he's so sought after is largely because of his uncanny ability to see with his ears. He's like a doctor in a way and, and instantly even just invent exercises that get crazy astounding results like before and afters like you've never heard before. And he's worked with all kinds of artists under the sun from Leona Lewis, Taylor Swift, Luke Bryan, Keith Urban, Miley Cyrus, and just tons and tons of names. And he's worked with Broadway productions and he is a true artist himself, which makes him also amazing. And, you know, he just has this passion for transforming people and getting them real results fast. And that's why I love this program. That's why I love this guy. He's like, he's like a brother to me. And um, I'm so excited to have him on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Leah. I appreciate it. You know, um, I remember before we ever had a chance to work and you had my, my program and uh, and I heard your record of that. Well, you're doing things I'm talking about. But when we work together, of course, it's going after a deeper level. Of course, you work with my amazing associate and next next the studio next door, uh, Chanel, who's been fantastic for you to exemplify that. And, and uh, her and I going targeting the same things to see how epic we can get your voice. And you've made tones that are covetable amongst even some of the best singers I've ever worked with. So it's a little bit time to sing your praises as well. Uh, not only are you this brilliant marketer, everybody knows that you have the ability to communicate how to build uh, a, a fan base and how to build a brand, which is, I mean, proof is that you've done it over and over and over, but that your music is, is an experience. The best description of anybody who listens to a record, it's an experience from beginning to end. It's not, here's a song and here's another song. Oh, here's another song that's cool. It's this experience that takes you kind of like almost a soundtrack. And I, I really appreciate that when I listen to your music because that's what I try to do with my music. It's like a soundtrack. And, and when people listen to it, they say, this is good driving music. It's to take me on a journey while I'm on a journey. So y'all, don't let the sun go down without getting her record, not just mine. I'm happy to buy my record. It doesn't make much sense to leave something on the table that can transform your life. And I think your music and people won't know that until they experience it, that your music transforms their lives just as much as your other information and maybe more. And that's the thing we forget too. And, and, and that's a good segue into, you know, we talked about the business era, we get in the business and we forget, oh gosh, I really am an artist. I really do still stare at this piano and go, wow, all those possibilities. Even today, I was experimenting with total new licks, trills, and runs. And I thought, you know, I, I've never, I never thought about that before today. And the thing is, for a person to develop their self as a brand, as a singer, you have to look and say, I would have never done that before. And I say, yeah, but you would now. And that's my bucket that maybe you've heard. It's on my singing success program. When I get to the style portion, I say, you want this big bucket called, but I would now. So what do you mean by but, but I would now? It's my bucket of, I would have done those things, but I would now. And those are those subtleties that some artists might do that you might never think, all the way down from Michael Jackson, and, you know, all those little percussive little hits that he does, or Prince going, yeah, you know, getting that, you know, when he does that, it's just so exciting. And then it goes from there to the, you know, hit a high note in his head voice and then go into this kind of scream. You would have never done that before, but you would now. Yeah, little things that can make a person great. And, and I like to say lately uh, is, that, is that singing is just sound making. How many sounds can you make? How, how compelling can you be? That is awesome. I love that so much. And I mean, you're, I, I, when I first heard your program, I just had this, I had this default setting that I think a lot of singers probably come to you with a default setting where it's like, 
oh, I have this kind of voice. I can't make those sounds because I wasn't built that way. I was not wired that way. And I just have this kind of voice. And that's what I came into your program with, you know, and now, uh, and, and it's like an ever evolving thing. I don't feel like I've arrived by any stretch of the imagination at all. Just like, you know, the way I learn business and marketing other things. And I, I, in fact, the more I learn, the more I feel like I don't know anything because <laughs> there's so much to learn. Right. And there's so much room for improvement. And, and same with, with what's happened with my voice as well. I'm just like, I feel like I'm just discovering the real me, the real voice that I have. So it's been so exciting going through this program and finding the, but I do nows of my own voice. It's been so fun. Well, I appreciate what you said, which is an, an age old, um, uh, for lack of a better word, mantra of those who are pursuing excellence is, or excellence or mastery is, or wisdom is the, the line from Carry On way, My Wayward Son from Kansas. And he says, and if I claim to be your wise man, surely means that I don't know. It's right. such a good line. Uh, that was one of the songs I sang in my first cover band. And I just remember hearing that song. If I claim to be a wise man, surely means I, I don't know. And quite frankly, wisdom and humility are best friends, you know? And a person can't claim to be humble. I did have a girl who, who she got really, really good too fast. And you know what I mean by this. Those people, they're so good that they know it too well. <laughs> they believe their own press. You've heard that expression? And I, I told her, and you're going to laugh at this, and if she ever saw in here, hey, girl, I didn't mention your name, and you're humble now because things have happened. But I, was t I told her, look, you're getting this record. She's in, I was helping put together a girl's crew, and she was the best voice in it. She was fantastic, amazing, kind of R&B girl from somewhere deep south here. And um, I said, when you go in there, I want you to show the record, because she had a an ego, a huge ego. I said, I want you to show the record label a side of you that is extremely humble. And here's what she said. Now think about this. One of the most self-contradicting, awesome statements I've ever heard. I just laughed inside. I was like, oh my gosh, this, you are not going to last. And, and I just laughed inside. She said, Brett, you will never find anyone more humble than me. <laughs> like, wow, that's, the most self-contradicting statement I think I have ever heard in my life. I literally was just trying not to erupt with laughter. The other girls were like, yeah, she's the best wife in the group. Just ask her. That's, that's it. And, and it was like that. She goes, you know what? I don't care. These other people, these other girls are in the group because it's me time. It's time for me to grow. And they are here to launch me. I'm the Beyonce of this group. I'm like, Oh my. And she got dropped fast and real fast. And she, now she raises dogs and that's fine. And she's sweet and she's married and it's a long time ago. And, and she, she learned. So you can humble yourself or be humbled. And um, one of the two is going to happen. And actually often both of them, even when you're humble, you're, you're humbling yourself, you get humbled. I think a lot of times we, for both of us, we've had, had conversations where we think, I just feel like I'm, I feel like I'm in a humbling, self-humbling place right now. And I feel like I'm trying to be humble. And then all of a sudden I get humbled. Like it's not until you get humbled that you realize how proud you really were. And that's for everybody. So the first step of the uh, humility says, I don't know. Or, or even, even if I think I do know, like, you know, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with jujitsu. Every time I go and I'm like throwing this move and I'm like, how about this one? He goes, no, 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 no. Don't do it like that. If I start going, but, 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 and I, you know, I don't say, but I say, oh, all right. Even if I think I'm right, I'm going to assume I'm wrong because there's always somebody who knows more than me. And I, if I'm going to put myself under somebody who does know something, if I'm actually going to trust them, I have to truly trust them. That's why I say somebody, if you don't have somebody that you can trust, then you don't have a source by which you can grow. For me, you know, you and I, we talk, we have this in common. We love reading philosophy and history and theology and all those things. And so I like find somebody I can trust. When, when I read them, they make me think, I wouldn't have thought that before, but I will now. Hmm. So, knowledge 
And wisdom should change you. That hunger that drives a person is the humility that says, man, um, you need to climb, you need to be climbing a mountain and look and not be disappointed with how far you've come. That's not far enough. I'm only, gosh, I'm only halfway up. But you can't be like, huh, look how far I am. You have to look at halfway up the mountain and look and say, wow, look at those tiny houses. I can't believe I've come this far. This is exciting. And, and, and be a little happy with that. And then turn around and they're like, oh, look at the mountain in front of me. Holy cow. And not be like, oh, look at the mountain. I haven't come very far. There's a mountain in front of me. That's self-defeating. And the other one is pride. Like, I don't need to go any further. I'm hiring these, these people. All I know is I'm better than them. Instead of, look how far I've come. Look how far I get to go. Mm -hmm. People tell me, said, Brett, what would you say about your own voice with what you're doing? I said, or well, first of all, I beat the living crap out of it, of teaching. So in that sense, it's a 10 times harder for me to grow than other people. And I said, and the people say, it sounds like an excuse. It's, just, it's a reality, actually, a reality that I've chosen for myself because I want to make as many people great as possible. I said, but it doesn't, but, but it doesn't stop me, this reality. I look at it as I say, if you have a million dollar racehorse, would you use it to pull a plow? No. That's why my great divas, I, I have a hard time letting them teach for me. I say, we're oh, so good. I say, you don't want to use that million dollar racehorse to pull a plow. And I said, but when I pull a plow, after I plow that field, I plant seeds and I grow singers. And I love it. So it's kind of been a sacrifice in a way because of this other passion that you have, obviously, you know, and it's, I, I'm the same way being like an artist and a coach and business person and trying to, you know, live that as, you know, ha, you know, the left brain and the right brain together. It, it can be challenging at times and you do make sacrifices as a coach for the people that you love and serve. Um, and that's just part of the gig, right? That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And the one feeds the other. That's all I can think of when you talk to my mind just kind of exploded like the sacrifice you make. But the sacrifice is what feeds the other one. When the, and they feed each other. You being an artist feeds you as a coach. You being a coach feeds you as an artist. Both figurative and literally <laughs> puts food on the table. And so, and, and so even for me as a coach, when I talk about that mountain in front of me, I'm excited. Like, Give me that mountain. Today, I, I heard a new thing about my workout. This girl I know, she's, she's lost. She used to, she said she got to a place of reality when she stepped on the scales. She says, I was a, always a bigger girl, 160, 170, and I thought it got a little more. And I didn't want to know if I was over 200 pounds. And she said, in high school, a girl from a Kentucky, good friend of mine, she's got all of her profile, her story. She says, when I stepped on the scale and I was 226 pounds, I was like, what happened? And she said, and a switch flipped. And she goes, no more. She went, cleaned out her copper. She went online and started reading everything she could. She knew that if I ate fruits and vegetables and exercise, that'd be up. Oh, so I'll start there. Fruits and vegetables. Immediately got down to 180 with like a couple months. Just kept working. Pretty soon she's 160, 170. Stays there, can't break through that. So it has to get more knowledge, get more wisdom. See, finds personal trainer, goes through personal training. Now she's doing a women's fitness contest. And she, I would say, is about 8% body fat. Wow. And she looks fantastic. She works at the health food store, the urban market. It's right by my house, a coffee shop. And uh, I see her all the time. I tell her she's my one-stop shop because I can ask her tons of questions. And she's just a, a uh, uh, an absolutely, uh, an encyclopedia of what to do if this happens do this she says well i'm trying to do that I'm, I'm trying to be what you are vocally in the exercise world and um but she got to a place where she realized and she's and and listening to her talk i said so what's your big aerobic secret because i know that you have to do the aerobics i love to run she goes well i i, I run intense but i take the treadmill up to 10 percent incline and run 10 miles an hour and when the first time I did it, I can only do it a few seconds. And then I got up to like 15, thought I was going to die. Now I can do it for two minutes. I went, what? So today I did that and I did it for 20 seconds. And I thought, I feel close to God right now because I think I might die. 
you know? <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. This is, but, you know, it's that, but I'm excited to do it. You know, when some people say, I know there's a dread sometimes about working out. And David Goggins is a guy that I like to follow. I'm not sure if you heard of him. This dude who's a, 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 Mar a Marine, a, a Air Force, Special Forces, a Army Ranger, a Navy SEAL. They all completed all these trainings. There's only one, only one of two people, I think, to do it. If I'm, I might be wrong on that, but, but you look it up. Anyway, but the biggest detail about him, he was 296, and he said that people called me fat, lazy, N-word. And he uses the word. He goes, and I was a fat, lazy, and he says the N-word. It was shocking when he says that. And he said, and then, you know, I, I, I was talked to this professor. And he goes, God, or not professor, this is my sergeant, when I lost some weight to, get, to go into the Air Force. And he said, he said, are you going to be that guy? He goes, because until you own who you really are, you cannot change anything. And he said, I, I ended up running my first 100-mile race. Shortly after that, I trained for it for four months, ran a 100-mile race. He said, I only trained two weeks to do the, the, the I had to, 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 to enter the race. I had to first run 100 miles in one day. And my, he said, my, my wife at the time, he's not married now, but he said, my wife at the time was watching me and he says, I had, she says, quit. I got to the 70 mile, mile marker and I, I had to run a, on a track, a one mile track, 70 laps on a one mile or a hundred laps on a one mile track. And I had stress fractures in my shins and my feet and I taped it up with electric tape as hard as I could. So I'm running flat feet now. I'm, I finally I'm walking. She says, you're not going to make it. You're running like you're walking, you're going like, 30 minute miles. I mean, that's a slow mile. And so he said, okay, I gotta, I gotta run. And he just took off and ran the last 20 miles and he did it. And he said, now, do I recommend everybody killing themselves to get in shape? No, but a lot of people don't do enough. They don't have enough passion, enough drive. Is so the motivation is absolute crap. Drive is unstoppable. Motivation is like, I, I, if I could get this, I would do this. Mm. Drive is like, I'm going to do this. There you, there's no, you're not stopping me. And so he is one of my, my kind of mentors. He, we don't know each other yet, but he, he mentors a friend of mine, and I'm going to be uh, working with him and having him push me. And when I, but, So I'm on the treadmill, and I'm thinking about David Goggins, this guy who's run more 100 miles races, is now just a machine, and he calls himself the hardest man in the world. Whoa. Yeah, and he just broke the world record for the most pull-ups in a day. He did it in his late, I think he was 39 when he did it. I think he was 42, now 43. And uh, he did 4,050 in one day. Oh. Now, I've done 100 in a day before, and I could barely lift my arms this day. <laughs> I could. I could because I worked up to it. You know, most pull up, most push ups I've done. And in, in a day, it was during watching the Titans game, I did 550 while watching that. Now, I'm, my goal is I want to do 1,000 in an hour. And I know well, I have a plan to do it. And, and it's, but those, it's that drive. It's that when, if you're driven, nobody could stop you. Because drive implies that something is in motion. And what's the Newton's law of, of motion is a, a, of physics is a, an object in motion stays in motion unless met with the resistance. And mm -hmm. so, the, the resi but the resistance that tries to stop you is the thing that strengthens you. If you break through your resistance, if you come to that place where I can't do this vocally, I'm trying, but I just can't break through. Ah, whose fault is that? Hmm. Are you a victim? Do you have vocal cords? Can you speak? Can you still make sound? Can you hear pitch? Can you hear, uh, beep? Tell me which one's higher. Well, the second one. Then you're not tone deaf. If you're not tone deaf, all music sounds like this. Regardless of what it is. If you're tone, if you're tone deaf, it's all you're hearing the same pitch. Do you hear pitch? you hear music? you hear chords? Nobody's tone deaf. It's one of the biggest lies I've ever heard in the music industry. This person's tone deaf. I said, no, they're uncoordinated. Can we talk about that for a second? About like, what's the biggest lie that people believe when they come in to see you that you are that you have to, you know, correct and like break through? What's the biggest one that you just see over and over again? Uh, I would say the first biggest lie would be that uh, 
and the range they're born with is the range they've got. That, that you can't sing higher. I've had somebody go, you know, a lot of times this, this people say, well, you can sing a little bit, or you can push your range a little higher. You don't push your range higher. You coordinate it higher. So it's like I always talk about a person, imagine if someone's in a concert and they go, You know, and now you just you just played it. So the voice isn't like her, her, her. Now there's something about power that creates energy that is, requires energy. But if I'm going I'm pushing harder, I'm gonna run out of notes. If I'm up here and I'm going, I don't even know how to sound today. It's the end of a long day teaching, but if I said. It's almost to a woman's eye C. If I can talk it, if I can find it, but I'm there. It feels a little shaky, it's a little tired. So fatigue is one thing, but strain is a whole nother. And if you have to strain to hit that note, you're never gonna get it right. And I can be tired and hit the note. And if I, you know, if I dig deeper, I'll, hit, I'll get a little more into it. But if I can get into that note because I just found it instead of forcing it, and and if I know there's a recipe, yeah, if I know there's a pathway to get there, and I, and and all I have to do is tell you is like, and you know this because you've experienced it like in dramatic ways almost traumatic, is like, hey, follow me, it's this way. And they go, really? You just walk this path. Just walk, just do these exercises. My kids sing in their mix so ridiculously easy. If you go, get on my Instagram, my kids are doing it, I don't know, but I've been told. My, my sister says, goes, I don't know, but, or my daughter, his sister, my little son's sister, 10, 11. She goes, I don't know, but I've been told. He goes, I've been told to make my lunch. I've been told when they're making their lunch. And they don't know I'm filming them. And they're wailing up high in their mix. And they're not thinking about it because nobody told them it was hard. That's amazing. That's amazing. Because we've conditioned ourselves to believe things that have be then they manifest as so, as so right? Yeah. yeah. What does uh, Henry Ford say? Whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. Pos positive thinking without the wisdom to accomplish it, it, it would accomplish it, is utter crap. Thinking, thinking well about yourself, if, if I take some guy that I work out with and he's in decent shape, but he's never been in a fight in his life, and some guy pushes him and he says, step outside, and he goes, you're gonna fight him? He goes, yeah, and the guy said, you could do it, man. Just put up your fist when he comes, just hit him. And that guy goes like this, he moves like this. He grabs that arm and he pulls and the arm bars and breaks his arm and chokes him unconscious. You know, the thing is, this guy has no training and he has no, he has no plan. The training, you have a plan to train and then you train, you get good at something and then you have a plan to fight, a fight plan. Like what you do, you provide for people a fight plan. You're fighting for your place in the industry. You're fighting for some relevancy. So having this positive image of what you think you can do and not having a plan or a direction on how to do it is what we call insanity. Doing the same things over and over, again, expecting a different result because, well, somebody programmed me to just believe in myself. I said, I can believe all I want that I can rip that guitar to shreds but unless i play with the metronome and continuously speed up my skills every day unless i have exercises that i can do that can actually transform me it won't get better just sitting there i have to pick it up people have to have some plan to coordinate this voice so you know i say what do you think you can or you can't you're right but guess what i said kind of you can't because you don't know but once you know, you find out. A guy, guy came to jujitsu, and the, you know, so my coaches tell me you use jujitsu expressions way too much, Brett. 
people can't relate. But it's ground fighting, you know, it's choking and submission. And this big wrestler came, huge guy, and he was like, he like said to my coach, my coach, big, ominous looking guy, and the guy said, hey man, what, what you know, I just want to kind of come in here and test my skill level, see where I'm at. He goes, what's your first day? You're a white belt, you're a beginner. And he goes, well, you, you, you assess me and see if I'm, I'm actually a higher level than that? He goes, he goes, well, I guess. And he goes, well, give me like one of your best fighters, you know, I want to roll with him, I want to grapple with him. And he goes, Brett's average and he's the oldest one. You can fight him. You can roll with him right now. And the guy looks at me and he goes, he goes no offense, man, uh, but can you give me some young big hoss to, to go with, you know, one of the big, those big dudes? And I go, no, no, no offense taken, man. You might beat me. I don't know. I've never, I've never grappled with you, so I don't know. And I'm looking at this, and Brad's going, I'm going to enjoy this. And he came in, I called putting the baby in the basket. It's this front guillotine choke, and I grabbed the back of his head. As he took me down, I went with it, put his head into some, boom, and I choked it, the crap out of him. His head stuck in here. And so he's trying like this, and he's like, <coughs> and he goes, you guys are rolling for 10 minutes, so just keep tapping. If you tap him once, I'll put a blue belt on you, he said to that guy. Huh. And the guy goes, oh, I've never seen that. Uh, okay, I, was, yeah, I wasn't ready. I guess I bet I'd be more defensive. And Brad, my brother Brad says, you're going to be a lot of things you haven't seen. Huh. And I choked this guy six ways this Sunday. And now, to his credit, he stuck around. And three years later, he beat me. Caught me in arm bars. And he was like, oh, I mean, it's almost apologetic. Like, hey, would that, was that legit? Yeah, man, you, you got me. I, I actually kind of put it out there for bait so I could sneak around behind you and choke you and got my arm on like, whoa, <laughs> got me. He's like, oh, but, but I'm not better. I said, dude, it ain't about better. You caught me. If it was just like basketball, if you score on me, you made the basket. Good for you. Uh, there ain't no ego about this. It ain't better. It's we're just training. I don't think I'm better than you when I tap you. I just think I knew something you didn't know. Now you know something. The last time we grappled, it was like for 30 minutes, and neither one beat each other. And he's, by the way, he's about five foot seven, I'm five ten, and he's about two fifteen and benches over 350 pounds. Wow. He was his neck like this. And we rolled and grappled and grappled, and I like, we both looked at each other like stalemate. He goes, Yeah, man, let's go get a drink. We're just butt, buddy up. But he had to be humble, he had to be broken. And I told him, I said, that girl over there, she will murder you. After the first day, he goes, man, man, I believe you. First time you roll with her, she choked the little snot out of it. <laughs> but it's, it's fun. It's fun to be humbled because it's the only time you're getting better. If I don't lose, I don't get better. If I play basketball with people I can beat, it ain't that deep. The only victory that to me that's truly meaningful is victory that occurs when the likelihood of defeat is present. That's so good. Can you talk about, we talked about like some myths that people have when they're coming in, beliefs about range and things like that. Now, what about mindset? Can we, can you talk about a coach and like the idea of, of leveling up our skill set? Cause that kind of ties into what you were just talking about right there about being humbled. And then also like, you know, approaching the mountain of what we see before us is the, it's the journey of the climb, but how does that tie into mindset and knowing that if you want to better results, you need to increase your skill level. Like there's in, in that, I say that from, for me, when the people I, I coach, I talk about that from, you know, um, a skill set level, like, you know, upping your skill set in business and in, you know, social media and marketing and knowing your audience and all those things. How do you come across that sort of thing in what you do? Well, I tell I, I tell people a lot, and it's not, it's not my quote, I've kind of adapted it from several different quotes, but I tell people, I say, there are two, diff two d different kinds of basketball players, dancers, business people, golfers, singers, fighters, two different kinds, trained and untrained. And let me tell you, the untrained are a liability to their team and to themselves. You can't trust them. The first thing they ask you when you get, are working on a record deal is like, do you have a coach? Because they, they you, who's your vocal coach? You, you got a vocal coach? Because they, somebody got to keep you healthy. Somebody's got to be able to fix this thing. Guess what? Pianist, you never need to fix him. Guitar player, you need to, never need to fix him. If he's playing good enough to get the gig, 
chances are he's always going to play that well. It's hard to screw up once you're that good. Uh, my friend Noah Henson, who was in the band Pillar, and he's got long dreads. You've probably seen him on social media. Good buddy of mine. Just can rip a guitar to shreds. Played place for uh, Brantley Gilbert. Went in there, and Brantley was like, hey, I used to do Pillar songs in my set. Good to see you. I used to be a youth pastor. Like, hey, see you. And he, you know, wow, I got the job. I didn't even know I could do this. I didn't know I could do country. I was rock guy. But he was so good. He's so good. He's consistent. We know. But the singer is a human instrument. And you must learn a couple things. How to diagnose and prescribe your voice for the worst possible day. Mm. You, you need to, you grow and develop on your best possible days. I'm like, I'm having a good voice today. I can do anything. I'm having a bad voice day today. I have one of the worst allergy attacks, and I'm usually pretty good with getting over allergies really fast. I used to have really bad allergies, and then I didn't have them, but I went to South Carolina, and I didn't bring all my herbs, all my special organic stuff, and I just said, oh, I'm just going to blow it out for a week, and, you know, I probably had one or two or three more beers than I should have had, Then uh, you know, because usually I'm pretty modest on that, and I still I never, ever, ever get drunk, but it was just the kind of steady thing of GMO-type food and uh, trash in my body. I got home and the palm couch here, I'm like this. I'm trying to see and I can't make any order. I'm talking like this. You know what the average person has to do? Tap out. I'm done. I can't sing today. I had one of my best voices, voice days that day. What? I couldn't get my voice to do what I wanted to, but my voice got me to do what it wanted to do. Whoa. <laughs> There's a lot behind that, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> you can think philosophically, what happened is my voice says, no, I don't want to do that. But I will do this. Uh, oh, wow. And my whistle, I remember my whistle was like completely gone. And that's the thing that's always there, even when I'm really, really bad. But my, my F, what was that? What um, was that? Because I... Taking my time. I just remember, like, what's happened to my voice? And guess what? It's still there. And I don't even know how I got it. So on my on my worst day, I could still climb that a little bit of that mountain. And like, oh, I actually there's another mountain over there that I haven't ever ever explored. But I kind of have to be with broken legs to walk up that mountain. Mm. That's really cool because there's a, there's so much that um, can can we can pull out of ourselves, but only when it kind of hurts in a way, you know. When when there's something at stake, you know. It, I find that if it's easy, you don't even appreciate you know your accomplishments in a way. It's just you have to have that struggle, and so I love that learning like how, how to pull that out of you on your worst vocal day. Like that is, that's amazing. Dolly, Dolly Parton says, find out what you do well and then do it on purpose. Hmm. That's cool. So once you learn how to do a certain thing, you learn, I said there, another thing is in one of my books that I've been writing, I've been writing so many books that I need to finish them all and release them one after another. But I'm, I'm the perpetual author. I write and I think, no, I can make this better. I mean, it took me forever to release Seeing Success 360 because I kept making it better. I'm finally like, you know, the Bono quote where he says, great records are never finished. They're just abandoned. Yeah. <laughs> like, all right. Okay. Let's release it. You know, it took me a long time to release my record. It was like five years on my record from the time it was done. Um, but uh, one of the books I'm writing is called On Coaching and Being Coached. And I think you'll appreciate that too as a, as a fellow coach and as a person who is being coached. And um, it always says there's two sides to being coached. There's two sides to coaching. One is learning how to do something really well. And the other one is learning how to do something really well every day <laughs> what's your plan from when you can't make a shot i mean i have bad vertigo i've been going through some concussion training or concussion therapy or recovery stuff that's been helping me neurologically it's, it's i guess the, the concussions have hurt my voice which my c5 vertebra is off and it pinched a nerve that goes to my vocal cords and so I thought, okay well, that makes sense so that's why 
some parts of my voice are a little bit, but see, it, it, because it is multifactorial, the temps, technical, emotional, mental, physiological, and spiritual, and all five have equal ultimacy in developing the voice. And if one in there, the weak link will hold you back. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, the physiological is as much eating healthy and strong lungs and all that other stuff, strong vocal cords, strong technique, uh, but physiological, well, there was the fatigue that was setting in, but I didn't know I had like a pinched nerve there that was caused probably from one of my six or seven concussions that we probably counted up as we started talking. He says, those are accumulative. And so um, I, I can have those excuses, uh, but I, it's up to me to do something about it. So when I'm diagnosing a voice, I'm saying, here's the exercise that fits your voice. My program is kind of a one, it's kind of like a, a P90X. Everybody can do that and get in shape. Mm -hmm. You go to a personal trainer because, okay, I'm in shape, but now I need to kick butt. Now I need to be way past my competition. Now I, I have to break through. And it's important that singers don't see singing too much as competition except for with themselves. Inescapably, it is competition with others. And here's why I'd say that. I tell them, first competition with yourself and you've got to be beating yourself. But it is with others, not in the sense that you have to seem better than others, but you have to, you are competing for ears. And the, the, question, the question you have to ask, answer, you have to have, be able to answer is, why should I listen to you? Exactly. And we have such a short amount of time to capture that attention as well. Like such a short amount of time. So it's like every second we're singing is precious time that is either going to, you know, capture somebody for life maybe, or they're just going to be on their way. Like the album I'm releasing this year, I, there's no fluff on the album at all. And I want to make sure that every single note I'm singing, every song on there is like, you know, the best that I could make it. And, and then also being able to humbly just like let it go at some point too, because you can't work on it forever. Yeah, it's like the author, it's just like the book is never finished, the album's never done, but you, you got to just resolve and part with it at some point and then work on the next thing. I'm already working on the next thing. So, yeah. um, and that's what we do. That's what we do as artists. I have the, all these quotes on this, this board here, right? I've got all these wonderful little quotes here that I just am always coming up with and up in the top there it says I would rather be dangerously interesting than technically boring wow uh, I like that now that's a quote for me because I'm a safe singer I tend to stay on the safe side of things when I came to you you're just like I gotta tear you up a little bit <laughs> and that's yeah. what a coach should do yeah abs absolutely because the thing is, too, that what people don't realize, the more technique you have, the more loose and reckless you can be and still be okay. I mean, before Steph Curry was Steph Curry, there were thousands and thousands of hours of dribbling uh, drills where he learned ball handling at a level that people hadn't seen. And people say, he's such a great shooter. And he goes, I'm going to be such a great shooter because I'm a great dribbler. Hmm. It's, it starts with just bouncing the ball. Before, if I can't control the ball on the floor, what makes you think I can do that in the air? Which is right. so great. He's so, he, he's just extremely wise. But he, but, and my son has become obsessed with basketball. He's 11. He, he's, he's got a great arm. He could be a quarterback. I love the fact that he loves sports. He loves music. He's very, very passionate, very driven. And uh, as is my daughter, she's more emotionally driven. He's more like cerebral, like I'm going to get this. And so as basketball, he's now practicing his dribbling an hour, two, sometimes three hours a day. And he's fantastic. And I've seen him juke kids are way much older. There's people like this fast movement. I told him, I said, all you need to do is that to get a person off. You can do a big movement or go like that. Just head movement, just go like this. He'll do this and you see the person's flinch. And then if they don't flinch, he'll cross them over. And, and his movements are so fast and so subtle. And he takes every movement that I teach him and masters it. And I will say masters it at 11. There are things that he has mastered. And here's the bigger surprise. This is his second season playing basketball. He just finished, which means he only played one season before. So if you think about when the season starts in January, he's only been playing basketball for a year and four months. Crazy. And, and there are people think that he's been playing all his life. 
And it's when, it, when you are diligent, you appear more free. Mm. Discipline brings freedom, as we know. But yeah. they, uh, they, those, those who are antinomian, the things that I hate laws, I hate structure, I hate order. Law sets you free. Structure sets you free. Have, having a plan that you adhere to and disciplining parts of your body and your mind and your voice and your musicality sets you free. Because I know theory, I can play, uh, there are way better pianists everywhere. Uh, but what I know is that I can sit here and play for days and not think about what I'm going to play next. I'll just keep going. I can just create with on, on the, because I know the instrument. I have freedom with mm. it. I know it inside and out. I've played just enough Chopin and Bach and Rachmaninoff, just enough to know that I'm not very good. Mm. But I, uh, and I can't play those concert pianos, p- piano pieces. I can play like a page or two of them, but I understand it. And because I can understand it, I can come to my level of music and be way more than what I need. Mm. And when you are way more than you need, then you develop subtlety. And for a person to develop themselves as a brand in the music industry, to, to get that stamp, that signature, they have to be able to say, if you can be like Haley, you saw her with that lesson with me that used to be up. Uh, manager does let us keep stuff like that for, up forever and understand. But she says, I'm outside. I've been waiting there's nothing else going on it is i am just singing the notes i'm not going dynamic and you're paralyzed by her mm. and she can do runs and trills like mariah carey her rib she can be, she, there was a time where she was doing uh, these little, these, uh, oh, 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 oh. And she's doing with the uh, metronome. You know, these are my program. You can yeah. do those, and it's, it, it, because it's Pro Tools got that sound file. It starts at 60 and ends like at 120. So you're starting at, uh, Da, 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 da. you're starting at uh, three notes a second and then eventually you're at six notes a second which is really fast but you don't feel it slowly turning up that tempo as you're going so you don't feel yourself like speeding up but I used to do that with her and pretty soon she was at 180 and then finally 200 that's 10 notes a second she's got runs that young Mariah Carey would be like oh girl Whoa. No and people don't know that and what happens is they sense something when she did that airplane sonnet Wish, wish right now, wish right now, don't now. It's because right. she's done thousands and thousands of times. When you're dribbling a ball thousands and thousands of times, you get somebody's in front of you. You're like, I'm, I'm not that good of a basketball player. I don't play that often, but I've got a couple moves that I've mastered, and I'm going to get you at least twice. But you're not showing all your cards at once. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the mystery, and that's the secret, and that's the, the magnet, I think. Because like there's a then you have this underlying confidence. You're just like I I know what I've got, but I'm not showing. I'm not giving it all away right now. You know, Precisely. and yeah, and then that, that's what I think. You it's like I don't need to right, and then it's just like at the right moment, at the right time, bringing out the right thing, and then making a huge impact. Right. And you and I have talked about, you know, there's people who like belt, like that's all they do now. It's like, so they became famous for this amazing belting or whatever, but now that's it. That's like the only tool in their toolbox now. And then it's not even impactful anymore. That's right. I'm so, I'm so glad you talked about that. I brought that up because I tell singers who like have voices are too trained or too good. I tell them, say, look, unless you can, Unless you can get in here and sing Mary Had a Little Lamb and Move Me, I don't think you're a singer yet. I think you're just a vocalist. You're not really singing. Mm. And they'll go, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. No, 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 no. Is that that what the song's about? I said, if your kids are on the Titanic, 
I want you to think of this, Leah. Really, you saw the movie, right? What's the most emotional scene in that movie? What's the most emotional? Oh, there's a few, but like when they're hanging on for dear life and he's slipping away into the water. Not even close. Which, what is it? Everybody, and I'm like, hey, that's relative, right? It's subjective. <laughs> Most, that's my emotions. The reason I say not even close and I say that with confidence to everybody, because everybody blocks out the most emotional scene because it's too heavy. What, what is it? You have to remind me. Mother who is locked down and she can't get up. They, she's in the lower levels and she's putting her kids down to sleep. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. And imagine you're putting your kids down to sleep and you know you're going to a watery grave with them. Yeah. And the, the cold air. And this is the interpret. This is once you have the chops, then it's get the mind and the soul connected to that. Like I say, singing with soul doesn't mean singing with lots of licks and runs. It means taking your soul and putting it right in front of the music. Mm. So I tell people, I say, so whatever you believe spiritually, if you don't believe you have a soul, you'll sing like it. Dang. So start like with that. Mm. Singing with soul means singing, singing with your soul. I said that to Leona Lewis yesterday in her session. She goes, oh, yes, 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 yes. She got so excited. She's so cute. She's adorable. That was, <sighs> that was good. That is really but, good. Yes, as I sing with the soul, I said, so you're on the Titanic. And imagine you're young. How old are your youngest kids? My youngest is three. Oh, and, and what else do you have after that? What's the next age? Six, okay, so eight, ten, twelve. So imagine your three year old, six year old, they're sharing that it's just you guys. And the ship is going to go down, and you're locked down, and you can't get up. You're pounding this icy, icy cold water, the frigid air starting to just chill you as the heat goes down. And you, the, the lights are flickering and even popping and you're saying this is over and the cold water rushes underneath there you can smell the salt the brine the, the fishy smell of the water the ice cold water and it's coming over your feet and as the water goes in your calves start to tighten up and you see the water hitting the bottom of the mattress and you're going to sink for them would you be like oh yeah I would say I would see them and I'd go, say, Mary had a little man, little man, little man, had Mary had a little man whose face was white as snow. in Italy and I go to this and I said I said um, Mary had to watch her lamb sweet baby lamb little lamb Mary had to watch her lamb suffer on the cross are you relating that singing that to your kids and at the very end if i said, said that if i'm singing mary had a little lamb or tweak a little star or whatever i'm singing i just pull back and say i this is not about me 
showing off my voice. I find a competitive singer is always trying to find a song to show off their voice. Right. But an artist is always trying to find their voice to show off a song. Mm. That is awesome. I feel like maybe I, 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 identify well identify with the story just told to you because i am a mother so i can just like i sing those little songs to my kids you know and i sing them to them at night when i am actually putting them down for the night and i can just imagine like yeah and, and and when i'm singing to my kids to sleep i don't show off my voice at all it's not about that it's about them it's about the context of the situation it's not about me and so i, I relate to that very much and that uh, feels and I'll argue that it's your best audience. That's my favorite audience. My kids. Yeah. Singing my kids, that's my favorite. That's the most meaningful singing. I say, yeah, I sing I do for, you know, I sing for this thing. And they're like 10,000 people there. You know, somebody asked me to come up and sing a song at this little conference that I think I was at. I got up there and sang. How do you think? Well, that was nice. Oh, singing for my kids beats everything. Mm-hmm. And if that beats everything, and this other is not that important to me, then am I self-absorbed? Like, please like me. Mm-hmm. No, I'm like, hey, I got something to give you. But if I if I say, here, you want this? It's an iPhone. Here, have it. I don't like. Please want this. Right. Please, it's an iPhone. I'm like, are oh, you gonna want it? Fine. All right, you want it? That's what your music has to be. Mm where you are confident, more confident in your voice than you are on, or than you are about your smartphone. Hmm. Where you know the thing that you're giving them that you can feel like, I, look, my voice is trash, beat up. I, don't, I literally don't care. It makes me feel more connected to my music. I have a track going on this new album that I'm releasing this year, and it's just like one keyboard and vocal. So it's very, very raw. It's an old traditional Scottish song actually. And I sang it, it was like a, it was one of those ones that was like a one take and I did it myself. And there's all kinds of little, just like little imperfections in it and like things that we did not correct on purpose because it would have just completely taken out the human element and just the emotion. And my producer, when he heard it, he said it gave him goosebumps and all that, which is like a huge compliment when you're working with somebody day in and day out, they just don't get goosebumps anymore. But if yeah. I think, you know, just because it's part of the, the grind, right? But at that point, you're just like, man, there's something very special about being able to be raw and be just let that emotion come out, even if it's sometimes not even pretty. It's, all, it's better in a way. <laughs> you know, so we kept it, it really is. And I, I often wait till I'm sick to record. Wow. I like the vulnerability and people sit there and there's, and I've had people say, man, I love your tone on my song. What if I, it's the only one I did a music video and it has like an octave range. It's one of the favorite songs I've ever written. And it says, well, what if I, would have done this, but I didn't. So I shouldn't wonder what if I. <laughs> but uh, the the message is very clear on on s- sovereignty and providence for for my for life. That there's something sovereign that and something providential that's happened in my life. And so asking what if is really a stupid question. But go ahead and I'll ask I'll ask it anyway. So I'm not gonna like belt that song out and I waited till the day after I lost my voice I couldn't talk and the engineer was like saying hey you want to wait another day and do this when your voice clears up and my my producer looked at me and goes no just let him sing and he smiled he knows what he's doing and he goes are you sure he goes the producer goes yeah just let him sing and he goes and then my producer said and I'm not saying that I'm I mean I, I I'm good for me there's thousands of thousands of millions of people better than me and thousands of people better than that. I'm just, I just need to be good, a good me, a great me. But I wanted to be the worst on that day so my voice would be vulnerable but, and then my tone. And my, my producer looked at the, the engineer and said, I told you. And then my producer, the engineer was like, dude, that was ridiculous. And it was two takes. We comp two takes. Wow. I mean, see one line over because he changed the word. He was, hey, what if you just said, said if I... Or I said, what if I, just say, if I were, and said, what if I, on this line, I said, okay, I like that. So that's the only line, that's the only line we punched. 
Mm. Two takes and it was done and we knew it was done. Because they got you got that rawness in there and that emotion in there that you you were just able to leverage the 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 raspiness and this that that sickness you just like harnessed it and then it yeah. just came out which you is know, perfect. You know why I didn't want to sing it again? Because even when my voice I waited for me to have a really bad voice day, I didn't want to sing it again because my voice is starting to come back. Oh, crazy! You're a crazy guy, man. This is awesome. Yeah, you I love gotta it. be crazy. We'll, yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll do another one of these where we're talking about the insanity that it takes to succeed. There's just so much we could, there's so many places we can go with this. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Like we, we talked about a range of different things and I, I hope that everybody, I know they're going to find it useful and insightful. And cause you're a really philosophical guy too. And being a coach, like they just, I think people, they're hungry for, you know, some deeper things like what we've been talking about today. So I think this is amazing. Let's do a part two and let's have you back and continue this conversation because this has been awesome. Thank you so much, Brett, for being here. I would love that. Thank you for having me. Leah. appreciate you.